Oh, but we didn't get it on. Did you come get your gift? No. Gloria's birthday is today. Patrick Miners or was this past the 11th. Patrick Miners was the 13th. Nevaeh Fairman was the 14th. Jeannie Priestess is the 16th. So now I know why she didn't feel up to coming to church today. Okay, so we have to sing the pat, and we've got one of the young people told me it was their birthday. This young lady right here, is that her birthday? Is that a yes? yes. Yeah. What's her name? CJ. CJ? CJ? Yeah. I remember, but there's another little girl who looks just like her. Vicky. Vicky. Oh, okay. Well, CJ and Patrick and Gloria, get down here, and who else did I say? Nevaeh. So let's sing, have anybody else need a birthday? September what? Sixth. All right, get up here. We'll sing happy birthday to you. Yay. Anybody else? Okay, let's sing happy birthday to all these. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday. not surprised, Patrick, that you chose lip moisturizer. From what I understand, you used all that you had at the corn maze last night. Is that right? That's what I heard too. Oh my. All right, let's take our hymn books, turn to number 178. 178, stand together. We'll do the first, second, and last verse of 178. in prayer if you would please.
right, let's take our bulletins, find your seats again, grab your bulletins. Poor Gary Fairman back there trying to count and everybody's moving around. <laughs> I'd wait till they sit down, Gary, don't worry about it. Oh my. Got some visitors with us this morning. I'm not going to embarrass them all by calling them out, but we're glad you're here. I think they're here, almost all of them, to see their, their children baptized, and that's always a good thing. Uh, we'll, we'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. If you take your bullet, then let me notice some announcements with you. First of all, we're glad Sherry's back and feeling better. Keep praying for her. Uh, for Sherry, did I tell you I figured out what's wrong with Richard's hip and what's been wrong with you? You had to strain yourself kicking him so often. We're glad they're both back. Uh, Fran is back in the service for the first time since open heart quadruple bypass surgery, and we're glad to see her. She has to go back in Wednesday for another procedure, um, an aneurysm on her stomach. They're going to do it uh, through the groin, uh, which is a good thing. She'll be home that afternoon. Uh, Betty is going in on Monday, and she has exploratory surgery, so pray for her. And the, the girl, Brenda, did we decide that was her name? Nobody could remember what the girl's name was. It was called through on a prayer chain. Mike, do you remember? Brenda Higgins? Pardon me? So we're praying for the family now then. She had undergone two strokes, one very major, and so she has passed. So let's continue to pray for the Higgins family. Don't notice some announcements with me in the bulletin, please. Choir practice today at 6 o'clock. And then we're having a baptismal service following the morning service. We're having another baptismal service tonight or next week. Next week in the evening. And so if you want to uh, uh, be ready to be baptized then, if you've made a profession of faith, if you'll see me, we'll talk about it and set it up for them. Tonight we have communion following the evening service, if you'd like to come for that. And then September the 27th is our birthday anniversary uh, celebration. We have cake and ice cream next door after Wednesday evening service for all the birthday celebrants and everybody else in the, that's here. October the 13th, we're having a bonfire to pastors. There is a little confusion about how this is working. I now find out that they were planning two bonfires, and I only have one pile of wood, so I'm not sure what they're doing. I've got a big pile of wood out back, but it, I don't think we can burn that one. Fire companies from every, all around would come looking at that flame. Uh, so we'll, we'll work it out. We'll get you some more information. Got plenty of time. It is at least for the teenagers and probably for anybody that would like to come. So that's the 13th. All right, let's turn in our hymn books to number 191. 191, while you're turning, let me just say a word about our uh, Jubilee that we just came through. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Tom Fry is a super good preacher. I really like him. I like him because he likes taters and I like taters. And he likes potatoes and I like potatoes and everything in between. Those of you who are here heard that story, and so you'll, you'll be reminded of that. And Tim and Ashley always do a good job, and of course we support them. I pray, I would ask you to pray for all of them uh, as they uh, travel and preach that God would give them the exact messages and the, the uh, energy and, and safety that they need. All right, number 191. Well, let's just stay seated.
I'll ask God's blessing on the offering, please. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing 459. First and last verses.
must never deny him just let me walk beside him for I was born to serve the Lord oh I was born to serve Take your Bibles with me this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. It has been a very unusual week this week. A number of things happened both in our family life and uh, in the the life of the ministry this week that have made it unusual. I'm not going to go into detail. But I will share with you the thing that caused me to preach the message I'm preaching this morning. Uh, There are times when things happen that just seem like it's it's a repeat of something that happened the day before. It's like deja vu. I think I said that, right? Uh, Somebody will say something to you and it will seem like you just heard that the day before. Well, this week, at least four times this week, I have heard people make statements about who goes to heaven and how people get to go to heaven. And it it surprises me that the age in which we live with the technology like it is, that there are people who still are uncertain about that. I've heard four times this week, four different people say, well, I believe in the Lord. And that's a good thing to believe that there's the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is believing there's the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't save anybody. I mean, it, that's like saying, I believe President Trump's the president. I mean, there's a fact about his, uh, his being alive. And there's a fact about Jesus being alive in the past. Uh, they did a survey not long ago, uh, Newsweek magazine in a place called BeliefNet. They asked f- uh, 1,004 Americans what they believe, how they practice their faith. One of the questions they asked them was this. Can a good person who isn't of your religious faith go to heaven or attain salvation or not? The question is really, do you get to go to heaven because you're a good person? Here's what the answers were. Evangelical Protestants, which in this survey, that would include what we are supposed to be. uh, They said 68% said yes, they can. Now think about that. 68% of supposedly Bible-believing people say that you can go to heaven because you're a good person. Now, don't get me wrong. We should all be good people. (laughs) Saved or lost, we should be good people. The next group was the non-evangelical Protestants, and they were the largest, or next to the largest group. They said 83% can go to heaven because of being a good person. The Catholic group said by 91% that people could go to heaven by being a good person. And I want you to think about this. Non-Christians, non-Christians said 73% of them that people could go to heaven by being a good person. Now, there's two things shocking about that, that there's so much confusion, number one. And number two, that evangelical Protestants, which most people would put us in, although we're not Protestants, we're Baptists, uh, they, they would put us in that group. There's only 5% difference between those of us who believe the Bible and those who do not believe the Bible at all and are not Christians saying that you can get to heaven by being a good person, a moral person. There are times that as a preacher you feel like you're preaching the same subject over and over and over. But I think sometimes we need to repeat it because we need to understand that it's not what I think but it's what God says is the truth. And it's not what I feel, it's what God says is true. You know, if it was just me, and I, it, way back in eternity past, made the decision, I would have probably wanted everybody just to be born saved. But God didn't choose to do it that way. So it behooves us to have some answer that agrees with God's thinking on this. And I'm going to show you scripture this morning in Matthew chapter 7 that I hope will help you with this. There are too many people <clears throat> that go by what they feel, what they think, what mom and dad thought, 
what uncle or aunt or grandma or grandpa or great grandpa or great grandma thought instead of what God thinks. There's only one person that has a right to open the gate of heaven and that's God himself. I can't tell him who to let in. I can't tell him who to keep out. I can't tell him whether a person has to have 10 good works or 100 good works and that should do it. But I can tell you from the word of God what standards he places on it. You see, the Bible's very plain about it. Contrary to popular belief, many people think that almost everybody is going to go to heaven. If you talk, I, as one guy I talked to this past week who told me he believed in God, he said, well, I've been, <clears throat> and he named it out, he was raised Catholic, went to a Jesuit, Jesuit college, and his wife is Episcopalian, so they go to the Episcopalian church. And then he summed it up by saying this, well, it doesn't matter because all churches get you to heaven. And I had to say, well, that's not what the Bible says. It's sad that people are putting their trust in all these other things. We know from Scripture, and I'm not even in the message yet, so just hang on, we'll get there. <clears throat> but the Scriptures say that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody to go to heaven. He wants everybody to be saved. And He offers it to everybody. We, we do not see anywhere in the Bible where it says just the smart folks could go, because that would leave me out. I'm pinto beans and cornbread. It doesn't say just the rich folks would, would get to go, because that would leave me out. Uh, Gene snuck up behind me and said, I want all the preacher's money. I said, well, you wouldn't get much, and he wouldn't. Doesn't say just all the handsome people could go, because again, that would leave me out. <laughs> Why did I anticipate this coming from this peanut gallery down here? But the truth is, God has a way of letting anybody in who will come his way. And so this morning, we want to try to look to see what the Bible says that Jesus said about who gets to go to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 13, he says there, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now the word straight there doesn't mean straight as we think about like a ruler. It means narrow. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And look at the next phrase. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Our Father, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit would move in a great way in the hearts of us that are gathered here. And I pray that we would respond as you speak to us through your word. I pray that we would see our need. We would see the need of the world around us. And we would be so burdened that we would have to respond. I pray that you'd speak to each heart. I pray that you'd allow me only to say what needs to be said. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's, here's the truth. There are those that believe, as I've already mentioned, that many are going to be saved. But the truth is, according to this passage I read, there's going to be just a few people saved. We are always, according to the Word of God as Christians, we are always going to be the minority. And sometimes I think it, it, it gets to the place where I hear preachers and Christian groups speaking as if they think they're going to be the majority here on earth. Well, this book is the only thing I know about. And this book says we're going to be the majority until Jesus sets up his rule on this earth. And that's not going to come yet. It could come at any moment. But till that time, we are going to be the minority on this earth. The Bible tells us very clearly 
that we are the minority. The Bible tells us that many will think they may be saved, but many will not be saved. Most people have one way or another putting it. I've talked to people and they've said to me, well, you know, Brother Gary, God's got to let me into heaven because I don't lie. Well, that's a good thing. We shouldn't lie. And I don't steal. And that's a good thing. You shouldn't steal. And I would give you the shirt off of my back if you needed it. And that's a good thing. We should be generous and we should be caring about other people. But nowhere in the Bible does that give, give us the right to think that we're going to heaven. Many think that they're going to heaven. Many think most will be saved. And yet Jesus says in this passage that we read, only a few will be saved. Brother Gary, you can't mean that. You can't mean that God who made the world and made man, and as Janice Song said that many folks don't think about, when God created the heavens and the earth, he, he made all that there is by his spoken word until he got the man. And when he got man, the Bible says he scooped up the dust of the ground formed him into a man, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. God took such a personal interest in people from the very beginning. He put them in a perfect garden. He allowed them to have their choice of what they ate, except for one tree. And when sin entered in by their disobedience, sin took away spiritual life. They continued to live a physical life, that was from that point on tormented with sickness and pain and suffering and work. And you ladies know the pain of childbirth and you know the agony of carrying a baby for nine months. All those things came about as a result of the sin entering into the world. God wanted fellowship and so he made them. But then they disobeyed. What do you do when your child disobeys? We punish them, we spank them, we discipline them. Well, why do you do that? We do it because we love them. God had to discipline Adam and Eve. He had to punish Adam and Eve because he had made a way to have fellowship with him forever and they disobeyed and went a different way. You mean to tell me God won't let everybody into heaven? No, he would. But man refuses. A holy, righteous God all through scripture has been doing judgments on people when they disobey. Uh, Patrick mentioned this morning the uh, complete disobedience back in the book of, of Genesis. And you need to, to remember that when the flood came, the Bible says that he had been patient with them with Noah preaching the gospel for 120 years and they continued to disobey and would not repent and get right with God. And he judged the whole earth. And only eight folks were saved. Noah and his family. Only eight. After they had had the opportunity to repent for 120 years and believe the preaching of the gospel as it, were, it was in the Old Testament, believe the preaching that God was who he said he was in the Old Testament and needed to be worshipped and obeyed as he said he did in the Old Testament. They completely ignored that and so God had to punish them and judge them because he is righteous. We would do well to remember also that there's a place, as, as Pat mentioned this morning also in the New Testament in, Matt, in uh, Romans chapter 9, it's called Sodom there, Soda, Sodoma, but here in the Old Testament in Genesis it's called Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were so wicked that God was going to wipe them off of the face of the earth. But there was a righteous man living in Sodom. His name was Lot. He and his wife and his daughters. And the angels came and took Lot and his wife and his daughters out of Sodom and completely destroyed everybody and everything that was left in the city, including Lot's wife who desired to go back and looked back because she so longed for that lifestyle. We need to remember that God is absolutely a God of love, but he is also a God of destruction. You need to remember back in the Old Testament that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, that God had uh, told them they could go into the promised land and because of their disobedience and lack of faith, they did not enter the promised land. Rather, they died in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. And at that time, 600,000, 603,000 and 550 men or more perished in the wilderness because they didn't believe God. God doesn't let just anybody do anything he wants to do. God, you know, we, we were talking about that this week. How is it that our children have any hope of turning out right with what, we let, what they are allowed to watch on television, 
which pictures all sorts of immorality and all sorts of ungodliness. You can go down, right down a list. You can go through all the sins that you want to and turn on the average television at night and you can find almost any sin you want portrayed as, as fashionable and fun and, and great on almost any channel any night. And then they turn them loose on video games where they're killing police people. They're uh, raping and killing and pledge, uh, 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 having uh, different, different accounts of, of violence. And then we wonder, well, how come there's so much violence amongst our teens group? We have parents now that are so protective of their children that they will go out and encourage their children to start fist fights just because they want their children to be top dog. I don't get that. We turn them loose in a drug society. We leave our medicine chests open to where they can get to your Percocet and to your Vicodin. And we say, well, they're not going to bother that. Well, you have no idea how many children first get hooked on drugs because they got in grandma's or grandpa's uh, medicine chest or mom and dad's medicine chest and got to their drugs and started taking them. Even though you're taking those drugs may be for a very good reason. And you may take them right. And how in the world are they going to turn out right? Well, they can't turn out right if there's not an absolute, if there's not some place that they can go to and say, this is not what I ought to be doing and this is what I should be doing. This is wrong and this is right and this is going to hurt me and this is not going to hurt me. God has that way. And in his Bible, in his word, he tells us that there is only one way to get to heaven. And I'm sharing with you not as a Baptist way because you can be a Baptist and go to hell. I'm sharing this not as a Catholic way because you can be a Catholic and go to hell. It's not a Methodist way. It's not an Episcopalian way. It's not a Presbyterian way. It's a Bible way. The Bible says there's only one way. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. And few there be that find it. But let's not leave that broad gate yet. Because that broad gate, it tells us about here, it says in verse 13, and broad is the way that leadeth to, what's that next word? Destruction. Destruction. Now I'm going to meddle a little bit here, but I'm going to do it from a biblical perspective. When we were kids, we were raised, most of us in this room, with some sort of discipline and requirements on our lives from our parents. When some of us got to the age that we started having children, some of my age group started to say to themselves, well, I'm not going to be as hard on my kids as, as mom and dad were on me. And we started being a little more lenient. And then when our kids got old enough that they had kids, they said, well, I'm not going to be as hard on my kids as my mom and dad were on me, although we weren't as hard on our kids as my, our moms and dads were on us. And they got to be a little more lenient. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself why mom and dad were so di disciplined on you? Why they were so difficult to live with? Did your mom and dad ever once say, hey, Gloria, I want you to go out and rob a bank? But they probably did say to you, you be careful of the boys you date. Not that it helped much. <laughs> I'm kidding, Gloria. Patrick, when you were growing up, did your mom and dad say, I want you to go out this week and I want you to get high on drugs every night? Absolutely not. You know, we, we as teenagers and young people, and all of us did this, we look back and we say, well, God had this, our, our, our parents have these strict rules, and I don't like them. And we wanted to rebel and throw them off. But we failed to see that those rules were there just for the same reason that if you lived on a heavily traveled road, your parents probably had a fence around your front yard. They weren't there to be mean to you. They were there because they loved you and they wanted to protect you. When the Bible says straight is the gate, and narrows the way, he wants to protect us. Why? Because that broad road leads to destruction. Your children, my children, all have had choices to make. Sometimes they make horrible choices. Sometimes they make tragic choices. But they have to choose between that straight way, that narrow way that most people don't go to, or they have to go to that broad way that ends in destruction. And folks, I'm just going to tell you flat out, I am broken hearted over preaching funerals over kids because of drugs and alcohol and behaviors that kill them. You're not in my shoes. 
You don't know what it's like to have to talk to parents who have had children die because of drugs or alcohol or a combination of that and driving or whatever. You don't know what it's like to have to try to tell those folks, God understands your heartache. Well, none of us would ask that for our children. We've all had children. When you held that little baby in your arms, did you say to that baby, I'm going to let you run wild and do whatever you want because I want you to have a fun, knowing that fun kills you? Talked to a drug addict just this week, and I told this person, I said, you've been on drugs long enough to know that there's only two ways out. You either get clean or you die. You get clean or you die. I don't want our kids to have that problem. And I don't want them to think that because God's ways are so, as they would say, narrow-minded and strict and rigid, that they can't have any fun. Any of the kids going to corn maze that are in here? Did you go to corn? Did you have fun last night? Did you really? You didn't get drunk, did you? You didn't take drugs, did you? You didn't, you didn't follow the leadership of Pat and, and uh, Isabel and find you a dark corner of the corn maze with your boyfriend, did you? No, see? Anybody else going to on the corn maze last night sitting here? I'm not asking Louise. I know better. I know what you got. I'm talking about kids. The point is they think Christians can't have any fun, and to have fun they have to go out into the world. Well, the world uses fun as a bait as a lure, and that broad road sucks them in with those lures and those baits so that they can kill them and destroy them. You say, Brother Gary, I don't believe that. Listen, Jesus said that Satan has come, the, the, the work of Satan is to kill and murder and destroy. That's what Jesus said. So you allow your child free reign, like all of us want our kids to have fun, but I don't want them dying in that fun. The Bible says there's pleasures of sin for a season. And Satan used those lures, he uses that bait to suck them in to that broad way. I want to mention to you, though, that Jesus is the way that we can get to heaven. And I hear people say, you know, I believe in Jesus. Well, the Bible says that the demons believe in Jesus and tremble. But they're not saved. When you say you believe in Jesus, like I said, it's just like saying that you recognize intellectually that there's a man called President Trump. There was a man called, uh, uh, what was the former president's name? Barack Obama. And there was a man called George W. Bush. And there was a man called Clinton. And there was another man called Bush. And there was another man called Reagan. And intellectually you say, yeah, I believe that Jesus was alive. But that still doesn't get you to heaven. Being religious doesn't get you to heaven. When we looked at Pat, Pat's Sunday school class this morning, it fit hand in glove with what I'm saying right now. If there were ever a group of people on the face of the earth that had religion, it was the Jewish people. But the practice of the religion without the worship and adoration of God was worthless. To the point that in Isaiah chapter 1, God says, I don't even want to see you offering a burnt sacrifice. I don't want to see you practicing holy days. I don't want to see you practicing a religious celebration. It makes me sick. Why? Because being religious doesn't mean anything. When I was in college, I haven't done it since then. When I was in college, I was out soul winning one morning, one afternoon. And I, I, I happened to get to talk to a Catholic priest. Now, I don't know how high in the hierarchy he was. He had a collar on backwards. And you know, there's all, I'm not Catholic, never have been, but I'm assuming that there's different layers, you know, bishops and priests and under priests and assistant priests. Somebody was in the Catholics tell me something. Is that about the way it was? Yeah, that's about the way it was, different hierarchy. I don't know how high up he was, but I asked him how he got to heaven. And you know what his answer was? I don't know. He was religious, but he didn't know how to get to heaven. Well, I told him how to get to heaven. He didn't get saved, but he knew how to get to heaven. And I don't doubt that there's people in this room who have heard the gospel presented, and they know that there's a Savior. And you may be religious. You may go to church all the time. Right, Phyllis? You may have thought for years that just by going to church that you're okay, that you're on your way to heaven. But the truth is, that's not the way it happens. Religious people die and go to hell. Why? How, how cruel is that? No, how absolutely right is that? 
Because you see, man is the one who comes up with religion. And religion is man's system to jump up and reach heaven and reach God, somehow be good enough to get to God. The Bible says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. You can be the most moral person on the face of the earth and not go to heaven. You can be the most religious person on the face of the earth and not go to heaven because there's only one way. The Bible says in John 14, verse 6, the words of our Savior, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Not knowing about him and not being religious and not going through religious ceremonies of some type, but knowing Jesus Christ. There was a religious man in the book of Acts. His name was Cornelius. He needed Jesus. There are other, many other religious people that we could mention. There were, and according to the book of Acts, there were the devout Jews on the day of Pentecost. They needed Jesus. There was the Ethiopian eunuch that was returning from Jerusalem, a convert apparently to Judaism, but so re religious and so dev devoted that he had made the, the journey to Jerusalem so that he could go through the worship act. On his way home, Philip meets his chariot in the desert and explains to him Jesus, and he saw his need for Jesus. Lydia, worshiping by the river, God, but was lost because she did not know Jesus. And Paul the Apostle preached, and she trusted Jesus. Saul of Tarsus himself, he thought he was doing good, and he was as religious as they come. A Pharisee of the Pharisees, probably a member of the Sanhedrin, and out persecuting Christians because he thought that would make him more acceptable in the sight of God. But... Jesus knocked him to his knees one day and he said, Lord, what must I do? What would you have me to do? So it's all about the person, the relationship, and not the religion. You cannot be a Christian by just knowing about Jesus. You can read this book cover to cover and you could know it and quote it better than I do. But if you have no relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that doesn't get you to heaven. A lady just told me recently, well, I read my Bible, I do my devotions, and I said, but do you know Jesus? And she stumbled at that. It's knowing Jesus. Jesus is the Savior of the world. The Bible says there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. When we have our vacation Bible school here, when we have our junior church next door, we have all that we have so that we can tell people the story of Jesus. We have our services, we have our jubilees, we have special services. Why? Because people need to hear about Jesus so they can put their trust in him. Now what does that mean? That means when you come to Jesus and you say, well, I've been religious all my life, he's going to say, just like he said to these people in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The Bible is very clear about how we get to heaven. The Bible is so plain that it's simple enough that a child can understand it. I don't preach a different gospel when I'm preaching to the vacation Bible school kids and they're anywhere from 5 to 12 years old. The, the teenagers, when we preach to them, it's the same Bible, same gospel. The parents and everybody else that comes to church, it's the same Bible, it's the same gospel. It's so simple. How do I get to know that I'm on my way to heaven? The Bible says first thing you have to know is you have to realize that you can't get there by yourself. The Bible says we're all sinners for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. What's that mean? That means I've done things wrong. I've lied. I've done things that I don't even want to talk about. And you've done things you don't ever want to talk about. Gloria just told us that. Be careful what you say. Don't go there, right, preacher? We've all done things we don't want to talk about. And those things God says are sin. And because of those things, we've come short of his glory. How do we get the glory of God? We can't muster it up on our own. I can't be good enough to have God's glory in my life. But I can realize that that glory is available through the Son of God. How does that happen? I'm a sinner, but God proved his love, commended his love toward us, and yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His righteousness, his goodness, is the sacrifice that was given for me. His perfect blood was shed on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. 
The Bible says it didn't pay just for my sin, but it says in 1 John, it paid the, the complete price for my sin, not for my sin only, but for the sins of the whole world. Everybody's sin has been paid for, but you have to receive the payment. How's that work? Well, simple. Christmas is coming up. I knew there'd be a way I could throw this in, make some of you rejoice. There's only 15 more Fridays before Christmas. Where has this year gone? But we're going to give and exchange gifts probably at Christmas time. You don't work for that gift. You don't work for salvation. The Bible says the wages of sin, what we've done, brings death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And he offers that eternal life as a gift. His precious son, Jesus, died on the cross and he offers that as a gift to us. He says, in essence, you have ruined your life because of your sin and now I'm offering you a sinless life in my son. All you have to do is take it. Well, it can't be that simple. Then Jesus lies. And the word of God lies. But you see, here's the thing. When you take that salvation, you take that sinless life for the future where your sins have been wiped out by the hand of God, you have to begin to want to live for God and you have to allow God to change your life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. I tell folks like this, when you, tell, when you first say that, people say, oh man, I'll have to quit doing this, and I'll have to quit doing this. I have to. No, no, don't worry about those things you think you have to quit doing. Just think about it this way. Without Christ, there's no hope. With Christ, there's endless hope. Without Christ, there's no love. With Christ, there is love. Without Christ, there's no forgiveness. With Christ, there is forgiveness. Without Christ, there's no peace in my heart. With Christ, there is peace in my heart. And when he brings those things into your life and you begin to grow as a Christian, you'll notice that God's changing your life from the inside out. It's not you saying, well, this is what I've got to do. I've got to get rid of this and this and this and this. Stop going there. Quit doing this. Quit having this. Stuff. No. God changes you from the inside out. How many are going to heaven? As many that have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Will it be the majority? No, because the majority has been blinded by Satan. The Bible says if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that have been blinded by Satan, the God of this world. Can I tell you, God wants to open your life up and give you a beautiful life. He wants to bless you more than you've ever experienced, love you more than you've ever experienced, a different type of love, a deeper kind of love, a love that you won't, won't be able to believe is yours if you'll just trust him as your Savior. If you'll ask him to save you. How do I do that? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, how does that work? Can I demonstrate it like I do with the Vacation Bible School kids? Patrick, come up here, will you? What did I do to get Patrick to come up here? What did I do to get Jesus to come into my life? Just call. I didn't plead, Patrick, will you please come up here? Patrick, if I've been good enough, will you come up here? Patrick, if I'm smart enough or rich enough or I've been faithful to church enough, will you come up here? I just called him. Thank you. You did a good job. You did a good job. And that's saying something for, for a retired lieutenant colonel out of the army, isn't it, Isabel? But that's how you get Jesus. Have you ever just called him and believed that he would forgive you of all that sin? regardless of how black, how dark, how damnable, he forgives that sin. And he blots it out and takes it away. And in God's word, he says, I don't ever remember it again. And he gives you a new life. How many will be saved? As many as want to be and will trust what Jesus has done for them to purchase their salvation. Are you in that group this morning? If you were to die right this moment, are you sure you'd go to heaven? I'm not asking if you're a member of the church. I don't care if you're a member of this church. If you're going to hell, it doesn't matter. 
You need to be saved. I'm not asking you whether you're a good person or not. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you are, are better than most. But are you saved? Have you ever asked Jesus to save you? Our Father, this morning I pray that as we have this invitation time, that Lord, you would continue to speak to hearts and bring, bring conviction where it's needed. I pray that you'd help people to be honest and to respond to you and your word. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would say to me right now, Brother Gary, there's no doubt in my mind, if I die right now, I'm certain that I would go to heaven. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up and hold it real high for just a minute? Thank you. Some hands couldn't go up. I appreciate your honesty. But now let me ask you, what would you trade for hell, for heaven? Would you trade hell for heaven? Would you trade your lifestyle, your hopelessness, your lack of love, whatever the problem is in your life, would you trade that for heaven? Or would you say this morning, Brother Gary, I'm concerned about my eternal destiny. I want to go to heaven. Pray for me as you close in prayer this morning. Would you slip your hand up and let me see it? Let me pray for you. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? You're not sure you're on your way to heaven? Anybody at all? How about Christians? Do you know somebody that's lost, somebody that's not saved? Would you say, Brother Gary, pray with me about those people, that Jesus would get to them, that somehow we'd get the gospel to them? Pray with me. Would you slip your hand up and hold it for just a minute? Thank you. Put it down. Father, I pray now as we go into this invitation time that you would allow us to move, to bow the knee and pray for those who are lost, for those who are here and couldn't raise their hand. Lord, I pray that you would make it serious to them, help them to see that the eternal destiny, the destruction that the broad road brings, there's no cure once we've reached the end of our lives. There's no second chances or do-overs after we're dead but we should take advantage of the opportunities now. Let's stand with our heads bowed, eyes closed. Janice is going to play the invitation hymn. If God spoke to your heart, you need to come, you come. If you're here and you're not sure you're saved, I'm going to be here at the front. If you'll uh, come up here and take my hand, one of us will take the word of God and show you how you can be certain you're saved. While the invitation's going, the ones who are here that are going to be baptized need to go to their prospective spots, the boys in my office, the girls in the nursery. And we'll get ready for baptism in just a moment. But the, the importance of this invitation cannot be overstated. Make a decision for God this morning. Either to help lead somebody to the Lord or to get close to God and have that relationship that you need yourself. The piano is going to play. If you need to come, you step out and come.
that you can be seated where you're at. I want to share just a couple of thoughts with you about baptism. I mentioned to you already in the message that, that the ceremonies that Christians partake in do not get them saved. Uh, the ceremony of baptism is a picture of what Christ has already done in a person's heart. It pictures a death to an old way of life, a burial to the old way of life, and a resurrection in the new life. It does not save you. It's just a testimony because we're commanded to do it to share what God has done for us. It's also a time where we show that we're not ashamed and we're going to take a stand for the Lord. Uh, part of Pat's uh, passage in Romans chapter 9 speaks about not being ashamed of him. Uh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of him on earth, he will not confess you before God if we don't confess him before earth. So this concept of secret Christians is really kind of strange to the, to the uh, Bible's way of thinking. So I'm going to go get changed, and Mr. Pete is going to, he's going to lead us in a song. So I guess you're going to be wherever you want to be. You want to be up there, you want to be down here. If you stay down here, they don't have to listen to your voice as bad. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't like my voice either. 243 in your hymn books, we're going to sing Victory in Jesus. 243.
think we're good. Pull the big plug out. This heater runs on 220 and it's never given us a problem. It's shocking per se, but I don't ever want to take the chance. I'll tell you a story someday when we have time about almost getting electrocuted in a battery. <laughs> this is one of our bus kids getting ready to come in. This is CJ, and she's been around a long time. She's got, a, she's got another little girl who looks almost just like her, Vicki, and they're not related, right? Yes, they are. Sisters. Oh, they are? Yes. Is she here? No, no, no. She oh, to See what I know? <laughs> Told you if you had to be smart to get to heaven, I couldn't make it. Okay, CJ, let's do this. We'll do this quick. She's freezing to death. CJ, because of your open and public profession of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried and raised to walk in the name of life. You know, some people don't think that kids should be allowed to get saved. But Jesus said, suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. You've got to humble Here. your heart, humble your life, just like a little child Harvest. in order to get to heaven. This is Abel. we're calling John up is John is Ava's brother. And CJ. And CJ's brother. I'll get them all straight away. When we get to heaven, I don't know how all this fits together. John, because you're open in public profession, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Barry. And raise the wall. Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried.
Mrs. Tiffany. She's got, let me see, a mom, a grandmom, and I don't know who else here this morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, because of your open and public profession of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried and raised the Lord. Next Sunday evening, we're having a baptismal service. I don't think we're having one tonight. It depends on whether the lady gets here or not. But I have two adults that we're going to be baptizing. Uh, Phyllis, this one's grandmother, just got saved last Tuesday. So we're glad she got saved, and she's going to be baptized next Sunday night. Pete Lee and 